Hello again. We're privileged to have a, a keynote address from, from Ken Weinstein. Ken is a partner at, at Davis Polk and uh, a great American. His public service includes uh, having been an ADA in the Southern District of New York and in DC. He was then a general counsel and chief of staff at the FBI. He was a US attorney for the District of Columbia. He was the first founding um, head of the Justice Department's National, uh, National Security Division, and then Homeland Security Advisor in President Bush's White House. With that, Ken Weinstein. Okay, thanks very much. Whoever gave me the woo-hoo, I'm gonna buy you dessert, okay. Um, good to see everybody, and I appreciate the invitation to be here today. Um, I, um, what I think I want to do, really, is sort of build off the second panel, uh, talking about the obligation or perceived obligation to cooperate by the tech companies, actually by industry more broadly, uh, with government investigative efforts. And, uh, and I, I don't know about you all, but I found that to be, and I've been to a lot of panels. I've been on a lot of panels. I thought that one was one of the more substantive panels I've heard in terms of wrestling with a really tough issue and being able to address that issue both you know, in terms of the specifics of the concerns on both sides, or all sides, I should say, as well as the broader themes that are at play. So I wanna to try to follow on with that, see whether I can match their effort. Um, not sure that I can, but, um, but I do wanna say, um, say thanks to the folks on the last panel for sort of establishing the groundwork here for the remarks I'm gonna make. Uh, and also thank David Chris. David, are you still here? You take off. You took off? Okay, well, I walked in, and just as I walked in, I heard David Chris say those immortal words I've heard him say a thousand times before, jackbooted thuggery. I love it, that's a, that's a Chrisism, and um, I'm not sure whether he was singing the praises or evils of jackbooted thuggery, but, uh, but that's, a, that's a word I actually teach his law school class that he designed here in Georgetown, and so every year I try to use that term and some other uh, Chrisisms to just get the students um, provoke them, and it works. Anyway, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make, I guess, sort of broadly two points. Um, first, that actually contrary to what David said, I think I disagree with him a little bit on this. And he said, or suggested toward the end, that he thinks the relationship right now between the tech industry and government really isn't all that qualitatively different from what we've seen in the past. I actually think it is. I think we're at a different moment in history in the relationship between the providers and the government. And I'll explain why I think that and the implications of that difference from, from uh, the historical background. And then the second is, to the extent we are in an impasse in terms of the coordination and cooperation between the providers and the government in the investigative arena, it's really up to Congress to step in and address the problems and, and come up with solutions. We've seen that some, but we haven't seen it enough. And so my second point is really to be, is, is a, a call to action on the part of Congress, that that's the entity that needs to step up. And look, in, in terms of Congress, I'm, a, a, you know, I'm, I'm realistic. Congress is not the panacea. It's not been in the past. It hasn't necessarily been sort of the perfect uh, or hasn't gone through a perfect process of balancing national security and privacy. Um, all too often, you know, they, they don't proactively address these issues. They're only forced to often after court cases. I mean, we saw that with Katz, the Katz case leading to Title III uh, back in whatever, 67, 68. Saw that with the Microsoft case leading to the Cloud Act. So sometimes it doesn't actually happen until a court uh, case forces Congress's hand. Oftentimes, as uh, alluded to in the last panel, there's legislation by crisis. A crisis happens, Congress steps up and feels like it's gotta do something about it to show that they're reacting to the Congress and of course, to the crisis, and of course there's no better example of that than the Patriot Act after 9-11, whatever it was, six weeks after 9-11. I see Jack Livingston back there, he and I sort of went through that, you know, the, the aftermath of that process together at the FBI. Uh, I actually think the Patriot Act was a pretty good piece of legislation given that it was done in six weeks but it would have been better had it been done more thoughtfully you know, prior to the crisis rather than the immediate aftermath of the crisis. And even the FISA Amendments Act, which I think is a 
tremendous piece of legislation in 2008. Um, that really ultimately didn't go through until it was perceived that there was a crisis, that there was a surveillance gap that needed to be addressed, and that there was this national intelligence estimate talking about how Al Qaeda was sort of refranchising around the world, and that there was an uh, imperative to, to get legislation through. So once again, you, you saw either a real crisis that had happened or a perceived looming crisis that forces Congress's hands. And you know I think that's not an optimal way to legislate. And then another weakness of the congressional legislative process is that it's always way behind whatever technological change has led to the balancing or the rebalancing of privacy and national security. And you know using the FISA Amendments Act as an example, um, that was meant to address the fact that, that the advent of the World Wide Web since FISA had been passed in 1978, the fact that the new technology that was uh, part of that worldwide infrastructure didn't really fit with the terminology that was used in the FISA statute, and that took about a good 15 years or so after the, the problem was identified for it, it actually to be fixed, and that took until 2008. So, look, Congress is not perfect. Congress sometimes is slow to act, but they're really the only game in town when it comes to ultimately balancing and finally addressing these issues. And we need that now more than ever. And that gets back to my, my point about how I think we really are in a situation now where we're at a, at a greater point of impasse than we've had before. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is, I don't know about you, but I just, I think maybe because I'm just an old guy and I, it's hard for me to really understand all these technological changes, it just seems like there, there's sort of a dizzying pace of technological change that impacts surveillance capabilities and investigative capabilities. Um, you know, and so the, the faster that happens, of course, the harder it is to get parties in a room to address, okay, what, what it would be the legislative response to this change. So part of it is just that, just the pace of technological change. But I also think there, it really, it being the, the greater level of impasse, comes back to a change. I think there has been a fundamental change in the level, in the relationship between the providers and the government, number of ways. And I think, and this is a little bit simplistic to say this, but traditionally I think providers didn't see a disincentive to cooperation with the United States government when it came to investigations. There wasn't an identifiable downside to doing it. And you know, I, I often think back to when I was a prosecutor here in DC uh, or up in New York, you know, there are myriad times where I'd go to the providers and ask for cooperation, not anything that was extrajudicial, but I'd ask for you know, assistance quickly, for example, and always got a, a positive response. And one example I remember, you know, I was telling my kids about the other day, I had a, um, a guy who'd killed a little 14-year-old boy and, uh, in the Vietnamese community here in town. It was a terribly tragic case. Um, and he disappeared. The guy that we suspected of doing it disappeared. Fortunately, I'd had him in my office to question him, and I had his cell phone. So we call the provider, the provider you know, runs it, and sure enough, we see the cell phone hitting towers all the way up Route 95 going to the Canadian border. Um, you know, They gave us that information like that, didn't get, make us go through any red tape, got the alert out of the border, and we stopped the guys who was trying to get into Canada to get back to Vietnam and, and escape justice. I use that as just an example of, of where you know there was no downside to the provider cooperating with us or being perceived as cooperating with us. That cooperation still happens. I'm not trying to suggest that the providers have clammed up and said, nope, you know, close for cooperation business. That's not the case. The cooperation I just alluded to, you talk to operators, FBI agents, prosecutors, they'll say that happens all the time. Folks in the intelligence community say, yeah, we get that kind of assistance. Remember the whole terrorist surveillance program aftermath and the FISA Amendments Act? A large part of the, the controversy there was about um, immunizing the providers who had stepped up and helped out with the terrorist surveillance program. And you know, I, was, I got a briefing not too long ago from folks at Facebook and what, about the things that they're doing and other um, uh, companies in the industry are doing to help deal with terrorist content. I think someone is mentioning that, how there's some really admirable efforts there, getting rid of terrorist content, helping with um, criminal content child pornography, that kind of thing. So this cooperation is still there, but I think in this, particularly in the surveillance area, um, there's a chill in the air. And you know, there's, there are a number of reasons for that. One is the fundamental concern that you know, we saw actually in the Carpenter case the other day, that look, technology now is at a point where the government can get a much broader 360 view of a person and that person's activities than before. 
And so I think as just sort of sort of philosophical matter, companies are saying, gosh, you know, that's that's not just giving the cell sites to some guy who's fleeing a murder in DC on his way up to the border. This is really giving somebody a real, uh, giving the government insight into a person's personal sphere. So I think part of it is is that reservation, and it's a principal reservation. But I think there are other influences that are sort of leading to this change. And you know, some of them are kind of not really related directly to the, the merits of this debate necessarily, but like there's a cultural change. Um, I think you know, you look back to 20, 30, 40 years ago, the providers were, you know, your old school companies like AT&T, they, a lot of them were based on the East Coast. People that were, they were populated at the high levels and the C-suites of those companies by the same people, you know, people who had gone to the, the same school, they had gone to the same schools as people who were in the government, high level positions. They were from a generation where national security was sort of perceived as paramount, the World War II and post-World War II generation. Uh, and there was less of a concern about sort of the globalized economy and more concern about the U.S. and what was good for the U.S. And that's just not the case now. I mean, we just culturally have a different um, paradigm, especially in, in Silicon Valley. This is not a criticism. This is just the reality. It's more based on the West Coast, sort of geographic and cultural difference from D.C., which is sort of perceived as, you know, the, the center of the government's interests. Um, a lot of the executives are from... Stanford, Caltech, not necessarily drawn from the same, you know, same schools in the East Coast that where the government leaders traditionally were. And most importantly and understandably, people in the in in Silicon Valley and the industry see themselves now as part of a globalized economy, which we truly are. And the values at play are not just American values and American interests, but global values and international interests. So I think, you know, culturally there is a difference now that is not, we're not gonna go back to this. This is, it's a one-way ratchet. And so there's a different culture, which I think has created a little bit of daylight. There's also an ideological component to this. Um, you know, I think uh, the industry, the technological, the high-tech industry generally sort of sees technology as the mode of human advancement. And, you know, I think there is a sense, an understandable sense that anything that might retard that, anything that might run counter to the principles of privacy and the marketplace of ideas and um, uh, ensuring you know that the best technology out there for the best communications and the best sharing of ideas is counter to future progress. And you know we'll, I'll discuss that in a minute when we talk about the um, the encryption issue. But I think there is an ideological component that that you didn't really see previously when you're talking about just dealing with the AT and T's of the world. So the result of these changes, the result of these sort of influences, I think, is that um, you know when issues arise or requests come in, the first reflex of the companies might not be necessarily to cooperate. Um, and I think that has been compounded by the Snowden disclosures. And I agree, actually, with David Chris when he said, you know, maybe we've already reached the high water mark of the Snowden effect. I think that's true. I think we're sort of getting past that. But I think some of the companies, understandably, felt kind of burned when some of these disclosures came out and they felt like they had been used in a way that they, you know, that they hadn't bought into. And, um, and, and they saw what the impact overseas on their business was when customers overseas heard about this cooperation, witting or unwitting, and there was an impact on the, blo the bottom line. So I think you're seeing a pushback now, um, and uh, Snowden and Ostoden that would still be there. And some of it is, is purely self-interested, is a, is a matter of the bottom line, business concerns, but I think also some of it is rooted in genuinely held beliefs that um, they, the, the companies need to be very careful about you know, how they allow the government to peer into the private sphere of people's lives. And the upshot of this is that uh, we're really at loggerheads, I think, to a degree that we haven't been before. And this is a bad situation. It's bad for industry, and it's bad for national security and the government. In terms of industry, I think you heard that uh, very clearly from the representatives here today. I mean, the best thing for industry is absolute clarity. If there's a jump ball, whether you know they should or shouldn't cooperate, should draw a line for, pri for privacy, should uh, or should draw a line for privacy, that's bad. They want to have clarity. If there's not clarity, you've got litigation. Litigation is expensive. It's time consuming. Maybe it gets to an end result, like you know we saw with the Microsoft case. But how long did that take? to get that resolved and then get, you know, get actual legislation. Carpenter, which is really just sort of another stop along the road, but Carpenter took years to get to that point. 
And while they're waiting, and this is the business concern that I, I completely understand, while they're waiting for clarity, they're put in a very difficult position of having to voluntarily cooperate. There's not a legal compulsion, so the question is, do they voluntarily cooperate, which then runs risk for them. It's bad for their brand. It causes problems with customers overseas. Whereas, you know, if there's a legal obligation, they have to do it, they have to do it. That's the response to any criticism. In fact, after the Cloud Act, you heard members of the industry who had zealously pursued the, the underlying case saying, hey, this is good. We finally got clarity. We finally got a compulsion. We're, we're going to do what we need to do. So that sort of takes it off of their back and puts it on the law, which is where it should be. And then I think it's easy to see how it's bad for national security to be at loggerheads like this. Uh, you know, the encryption, I think, is the best example of that. And we'll just get to that in a minute. But, um, you know, there are... There are opportunities that we don't have to investigate. Uh, and to the extent that um, those, op you know, there are avenues like encryption, which require push and pull with the industry, you know, don't, don't forget. Um, I know the IG report criticized the FBI about how it handles certain things in the San Bernardino situation. But look, if you're running a hot terrorism investigation, the last thing you want to do is stop, file some papers, go to court, try to, you know, compel cooperation out of somebody, you, 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 know, you only are going to roll up a terrorist cell if you're able to get into that phone, you're able to get that information and move. So the, the situation we're in right now with encryption and then more generally is you know, bad for national security. So let me just talk for a few minutes about in, the encryption issue. And I think, I don't want to go over all the facts that have already been laid out here, but I think it is, it's a good example of how we're at this point in time that I think calls for action by Congress um, in terms of encryption and in terms of other areas of investigative activity by the government that needs to be dealt with. Um, look, I think one thing to think of, to keep in mind is we all talk about encryption, but encryption is actually the only the sort of the most recent installment or iteration of an issue that's been going on for a while. Like, you know, you, you go back to Title III and FISA, passed in the 70s, 60s and 70s, provide a scheme by which, you know, put simplistically, the government wants to get a wiretap, you go to a court, court gives you authorization, the court, then with that authorization, the, the government's allowed to get that surveillance, and then there's a second door, secondary order that they serve on the provider. The provider then takes that order and says, okay, I'll do, I'll put the alligator clip on this wire and I'll give you the, what comes out of it. That was easy, relatively simple, back when you only had a few providers. Um, but then over time, as providers multiplied, as modes of communication have diversified, that there are more and more companies that actually are own the parts of the communication backbone no longer had the capability to provide that assistance. As a result, you ended up with CALEA, which was the statute in 1994, I think it was, Communications Assistant for Law Enforcement which was intended to address that and did so in the telephony area, um, requiring providers to have the capability, to build in the capability to help law enforcement. But then that was just a Band-Aid because we've seen further diversification since then. And as a result, you had, as of like 2005, 2006, the general counsel of the FBI, Val Caproni at the time, was out there beating the drum that there were large numbers of providers who no longer could provide either could or would provide assistance to both law enforcement and national security investigations. That was just because these companies didn't build in the capability to do it. That issue then got hugely compounded by the advent of uh, endpoint and end-to-end -end encryption, uh, or default encryption in 2014, 2015, whatever it was. And so this is a long-running issue, and Congress hasn't been dealing with it for many years now. In terms of encryption, you've got strong arguments on both sides, and this is why you need a referee. I mean, the tech, uh, tech industry arguments are actually quite strong. They, their first argument that they lead with, which is a, a good one, which is, look, if you put a back door or you know, have escrow keys or whatever the accommodation is, that's going to undermine the integrity of the encryption and thereby put people's data at risk. So full stop, shouldn't uh, even think about any kind of accommodation. Even if there is an accommodation, it wouldn't be conf confined to the U.S., right? Um, you, you, if the, the company decides to do it or agrees to do it for the U.S. government, why not some autocratic 
government? Why not some government that's really just trying to stamp out the scent? Uh, and won't the, in, won't the companies be on weaker footing when they try to push back against the Chinese or the Russians or whoever who are trying to use that, that um, back door not to solve a crime, not to protect against terrorism, but maybe just to get rid of uh, dissident groups in their country? Another argument, once again a very good one, it, once you require U.S. companies to provide some kind of backdoor, some kind of accommodation, won't the criminals and the terrorists just go to overseas providers who, don't, who don't, aren't subject to that requirement? Another good argument. And then the last one is the business argument, which is you know, any accommodation imposed on U.S. companies would put them at a business disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis clients or customers overseas, which is a, a strong argument. On the other hand, you've got government arg arguments, which I've already articulated, the need, the absolute need to get this information. And we've seen since 9-11, signals intelligence has been really the backbone of our counterterrorism efforts and our national security efforts generally. And that's only expanding because, you know, that's, that's how we, if you're looking at a geographically diffused group like a terrorist cell with control in one country, let's say Afghanistan or Pakistan, cell members in the U.S., financial support streams coming through the Middle East, all around the world, you're not going to get them at every node where they are, where they're physically located. You're going to have to go back against, go after them getting their communications, and you do that through signals intelligence. So anything like this that is expanding the darkness that's on the communication grid, um, the darkness from our investigative capabilities is going to undermine our ability to protect against the next um, the next attack. That's obviously the government's main argument. And then the second argument is really more of a suspicion. I think the, the, the government has articulated that, look, um, there, we've seen myriad situations where there's been a technological uh, change that has then uh, raised a privacy concern. And there's been maybe a not perfect, imperfect, but still workable solution. And that's we've reached that point issue after issue after issue. Why is it that this is the one for which there's absolutely no accommodation that can be, that can be implemented without undue damage to the integrity of encryption? So if you put an accommodation in place that requires some sort of you know, escrow key or what have you, and is designed in a way that, yeah, maybe some hacker can spend 1,000 hours and hack into one phone, that's a, that's a shame. That's, that's too bad, and that does undermine encryption. But is that worth law enforcement and national security apparatus being able to get that critical information when they have a lawful court order and they need it? I'm just positing that, but that I think there's a suspicion on the government's part that that argument has not actually been addressed by industry. Anyway, so you got these two sides both making strong arguments. We're at it sort of in many ways at equipoise, I think, in a lot of ways, and they're talking past each other. And the reason they're talking past each other is there's nobody, no forcing mechanism that's requiring them to come to the table and actually answer these questions. And I think, you know, as I just articulated about industry, to the extent that they, industry is being absolutist about their position, I totally get that. As an advocacy uh, strategy, I completely understand that. Um, because, you know, and, and I'm not saying that industry has not gotten into the, the workings of the argument. You've heard... Uh, technologists explain exactly why it is that any kind of accommodation would be damaging to, to the, the integrity of the encryption systems. But I, I, would underst I understand why they're holding the line. And until they are forced, until the government's forced to show their cards and explain not only how often encryption is a problem. We've heard about the 1,000 phones versus 7,000 phones or whatever it is that the, the FBI uh, messed up about. That was a stumble, no question. 1,000 is still a significant number of phones. But you know, that, that's, that to me is not really the issue. The issue is that this going dark is a serious concern from the government. They need to show that not only is it, are there a number of situations where they cannot get the data they need to solve crimes or to protect national security, but also that other sources of information won't adequately get them where they need to get. And that, that the industry has made that argument quite effectively, I think, that look, you know, Getting the actual data is not the only thing. There are other ways you can work around it. And I think the government has not made the case sufficiently that those workarounds are not sufficient. From my experience and my, what I've seen, I think they're, they're not sufficient, especially in a fast-paced um, 
terrorism investigation where you're trying to prevent the next attack. But I don't think the argument has been made sufficiently. So I think what we're going to do is we're just going to continue to limp along until we get to, and then this was prognosticated earlier today. And I think uh, Jamil has made this point. I always get, take any opportunity to subscribe to what Jamil says. But Jamil I, and somebody else wrote a good article which uh, said that, you know, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're probably going to end up hitting a crisis that will be a, a devastating attack. It will be determined that there was some encrypted information that would have helped to prevent that attack. Congress will then get kicked into action. They'll pass something that then is an overreaction, is not well thought through, and is actually more damaging to industry and to privacy than you would get if you were to go through a thoughtful process now. And I think that's right. And so my argument is, look, Congress should do exactly that. They should have hearings. And they've had some. I testified at one with Cy Vance, I guess about a year ago, the DA from uh, New York who makes a very compelling case that there are a lot of rape victims whose cases are not addressed, a lot of murder victim families who are waiting for justice, and they can't because there's a phone, and there's every reason to think there's evidence on that phone that they can't get into. Um, but I think you know we you need to either have a traditional legislative process, hearings, um, and go forward, or acknowledge that this is a particularly thorny issue with particularly strong arguments on both sides, with a particularly technologically dense um, issue space that might not be best done by traditional hearings, et cetera, but rather, as I think it was uh, Senator Warner and McCall, I think, proposed that there be a commission set up. And that I actually, I'll tell you, my usual reaction to any recommendation that there be a commission is sort of to run the other direction. I think of commissions being sort of an a, a reason to delay and blather and get people like me to sit around and drink coffee at a table and, and not really make any, uh, any headway. In this case, I think that I, there might have been some wisdom to that. For one, if they'd actually followed that course, we'd probably have something by now. That was a year and a half or whatever ago that, when that was recommended. But also because I think that's probably the best way to force both sides to come in and actually put the evidence, put the data on the table that makes the case for why there should or shouldn't be an accommodation, and if there should be one, how limited it should be. But right now, it's radio silence from the Hill. We're not getting anywhere. They're otherwise occupied, and I think they're um, missing an opportunity not only to address that issue, but to sort of establish or carry on the prototype of how Congress can take these kind of issues and actually do a pretty good job with them. I'm unlike most critics of Congress. I, my experience has been that when Congress really does roll up their sleeves and look at these national security issues, they do a pretty good job of it. I mean, you look at the most recent, the USA Freedom Act, not necessarily crazy about where they came out, but I thought it was a good, honest piece of legislation. They looked at the issue, the metadata program, thought about the various um, uh, various options of dealing with it, and came up with an option which was, you know, I'd say not half bad, and actually helped to settle that issue. We could then move on to the next one, which is an important purpose of legislation. And I also think the FISA Amendments Act was a great example of that. Once again, you know, there was a sort of slight murmurings of, of a crisis that led to that, but really that was a result of a number of members like uh, Senator Whitehouse and others who, and Senator Feinstein who really took the issue on, worked well with the, government, the executive branch, and came up with, a, I think, a pretty well-balanced piece of legislation that really balanced all the equities and helped to largely put the whole sort of inflamed issue of the terrorist surveillance program, warrantless wiretapping, all that, put it to bed. We can move on to the next issue. So, I'd like to see that in the, in the um, encryption space. I'd also like to see it in some of the other issues that I think are not getting the attention they need. Now, you know, for instance, um, you know, the, the whole question of American companies doing business over in China and China making demands for JVs and other mechanisms by which they obviously can just get um, sensitive information out of the American companies. I was glad to see Senator Warner, I think, sent a, a few letters just last week or two weeks ago to a number of American companies asking questions about that. Uh, I'd like to see legislative activity on that front. I, I applaud the, um, their efforts to take a look at the export control and the CFIUS, you know, inbound investment regulatory regimes, to try to harmonize them and make them uh, a little bit more robust, which I think we, we desperately need. I also would like to see them do something on um, the Russian interference, the cyber side of Russian interference. I don't know if you guys got into that earlier today with the cyber panel, but obviously there's a huge cyber dimension to that. I was up testifying just last week on that, and there's a lot of talk about various um, proposals, but we're not seeing any action. Once again, I think 
it's incumbent on, Cong on for Congress to do something about it. Um, whether it doesn't mean that they have to go and do something that's a matter of overreaction. I'm just concerned that we're going to get through the midterms. We're going to see the same uh, damage done that was done in 2016, and we're going to be sitting there thinking, we knew this was going to happen. Why haven't we done anything about it? And I don't think there will be an answer to it. So uh, just to, to finish up here, David used the term, I think, silver lining, that he, um, he thinks that you know we're actually maybe at a pivot point where some of the rough waters between industry and the government maybe is behind us. There might be, uh, you know, um, I actually think that might be the case. I think there might be a little silver lining, and I think he alluded to this, to the fact of the Russian interference, to the fact that the, the Chinese are really overplaying their hands by their sort of aggressive, grabby approach to American IP, in that I think it's actually making it easier for industry to maybe step back and say, okay, look, given these optics, given this general understanding that we're really facing some serious threats from our overseas adversaries, we need to actually work together on this. I think that might, there might be a silver lining to those two things that might result in a, uh, you know, a perceived convergence of interests that might result in maybe some of this um, difficulty in our relationship being behind us. So that's, uh, that's the optimistic sort of upshot of my remarks. So with that, I'm perfectly happy to take questions. Is that right? Timing-wise? We good? Okay. And, and what I'll do probably is since we have so many subject matter experts in the room who really know what they're talking about, I'll um, refer them all to Jack Livingston. So who has any questions? Everybody's going to agree with everything I say? But you do agree with me. So don't, you should raise your hand. Jamil Jaffer. How do you get Congress to, so you laid out this huge, so you laid out this, this obviously huge problem of Congress not legislating when it should, and that we only legislate in a crisis. So how do you make that happen? How does that, how does that get done in practice? We can sit here and say we want to do it all the time, but how does it actually, what, what, what does it take to make that happen, besides obviously a crisis? Right. Well, I think, let's say, let's take the encryption situation. I think it, it needs both the executive branch and industry coming in and saying, we want a resolution. Like the, Cloud Act. like the Cloud Act. We got the Cloud Act. We're much better off now. We join hands. And look, they're not saying we need a specific resolution, but we need to resolve this issue. And that, hence my point about, you know, it's better for, Cong for the industry if they, they see it's in their interest to have that clarity. They see it's in their interest to go in and resolve it. I think there's still this um, residual feeling that, no, we, we need to be, we need to draw the line on this. And I mean, we're still seeing that, right, with Apple and its you know, recent changes. So I think we, they, I, you know, I'm not to preach to industry, but I think ultimately, in order to avoid the eventuality that you predict in the aftermath of an attack, they need to come in with the executive branch and say, this is what we want. If they do that, you still have people who will push back on it, right? People on the left and, the, and on the, the farther sides of the right who will push back up on the hill, but I think it, that's overcome. But short of that, and short of an attack, I, I'm not terribly optimistic that on that front that we're going to get there. In, in terms of sort of more generally, look, it's hard work. The Fisa Amendments Act was hard work. But boy, I would think that any member who really was involved in that will look back in their career and think that was something where we really helped put a lot of consternation to bed. We put something under the rule of law. We regularized something, and we helped national security. I'd sort of want that on my tombstone if I was a, a former member of Congress. How do you respond to uh, folks that say, yeah, we hear the FBI complaining about the going dark problem, but the reality is, given our electronic lives, you've got more data and more avenues to pursue information about suspects than you ever had before. And what you're complaining about is, you know, maybe you've got 95% of the picture and you want the other 5%. And so maybe what you ought to do is double down on other investigative techniques that don't require us to decrypt uh, you know, the communications when they're in transit. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And I think, um, just to repeat something I said earlier, I don't think the government has really sufficiently responded to that argument. Now, i got to admit, I haven't kept up on all the literature, all the testimonies, you know, spent a lot of time filling out timesheets in my current existence. But, um, you know, so I might have missed one or two. But um, 
I, you know, I, I think that hasn't been made. Um, and look, the reality is in a sort of a traditional criminal investigation where you're looking to see, you know, after the fact, who committed the murder, who robbed the bank, what have you, you might have more time, right? It just doesn't work in a hot criminal um, counterterrorism investigation. And look, it's not as though you only have counterterrorism investigations that are fast moving right before 9-11 or right after 9-11. You know, they're happening all the time, right? And you, when you get one guy, you need to try to immediately get, back in my day, it was pocket litter, right? He, people had numbers written down in their, their what was called pocket litter. You had the, the agents pull that out immediately and we'd run those numbers and we'd go get those guys before the word of the arrest got out, right? People could destroy evidence or flee or what have you. Now it's, the, it's no longer the pocket litter, it's the phone. And, um, and I just, I, I think that that, like in the, even the San Bernardino case where the killers were dead, every reason to believe they might have been working with somebody else, you wanted to get those people before they fled. That's where I think there is no counter to that argument. I mean, I think that is a very legitimate argument. On, in other situations, you're right. There might be ways of, of workarounds, and I'm sure they're engaging those workarounds today. Um, but there's no substitute for getting onto someone's phone. And nowadays, you know, there's so much of your life is in that phone, in that device, that um, you know, it's a gold mine. There's a gentleman in the back here. Thank you very much. My name, <clears throat> my name is Yaya Fanusi with the United States of Africa 2017 Project Task Force. Actually, I came to this country in 1967. I was supposed to go to the Soviet bloc to be a student. I'm listening to you just now what you just said. Do you think you guys are wasting your time trying to go through all this, thinking the terrorists are not that smart to know that they should not use cell phone or lap or the internet, et cetera, et cetera? And what I'm saying is that yeah. since they know you're all trying to all do all this, do you think they will be that stupid <laughs> to be using the normal things that you could tap? Mm -hmm. The reason I'm telling you, for this project that I am with, which would have happened last year, September, if they are not killed Gaddafi, in which the 54 countries would be like the United States of America, I'm the one who replaced Gaddafi. And when I tell people, people will laugh, <laughs> like, who are you? Well, the reason you all don't know about us, we never use the same channel that could have been tapped to know that I was involved with Gaddafi. That actually is an excellent question. Um, don't, don't know, can't really address the Gaddafi aspect of that, but in terms of the, um, but your question about, look, the bad guys are not so stupid. They know that you're trying, that you, the government, are trying to wiretap their phones or laptops or communications. They're gonna go to overseas providers, they're gonna do, use other means. The answer is yes and no. Yes in the sense that you're right, there are some. Um, who are savvy enough to find secure comms that are not Ameri based you know, in the U.S., that are outside or beyond the reach of U.S. Um, the national security uh, intelligence community or law enforcement or those of our partners, no question. And back to the encryption debate, even if you do legislate obligations on the part of U.S. companies, there, you know, there's some number of terrorists and bad guys who will then just use overseas companies, who move to those companies. So that's a legitimate argument that the industry has made, pushing back on the idea of a legislative accommodation. So that's the yes part. The no part is, it's amazing how, and this is human nature, but people do what's easy and familiar. And um, I, I can go back to my days prosecuting these big drug rings. I can't tell you how many times I had a Title III wiretap in which we had somebody say, hey, we, I can't really talk about the deal we're doing tomorrow because this phone might be tapped. I, I can't tell you how many times that happened. And it's like, <laughs> why would you even say that? But it, and it's not just that criminals are stupid or terrorists are stupid. It's just, it's just, you know, you do what's easy. So some number of people are not going to make that move. So very good question, though. 